Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, educational info webinar today. Uh, my name is Gabriel Eko Serto. I'm the manager of education and patient services at Myeloma Canada. Um, today, our presentation will be about uh, MGUS and smoldering multiple myeloma. So uh, 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 we're very interested to be learning more about this, and I hope you are too. Um, before we get to our presenter and to uh, the presentation, I just want to go over a few things with you. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors for uh, for providing us with, uh, with with grants in order to do these. Uh, without their help, it would be very hard to do them. So, thanks to Amgen, Binding Site, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen, Takeda, and Sanofi. Um, as, as many of you know, all of our webinars are recorded and they are available on our YouTube channel. So uh, on YouTube, youtube.com, if you cl uh, click, if you write Myeloma Canada in, in, the, in the search, you'll, uh, you'll see our channel will pop up as one of the results. You can click on the subscribe button. Um, and, uh, and then once you've clicked on that, you'll, you'll also have the ability to click on the little bell icon. By doing that, you'll get a notification every single time we put a new video on. So that's it's a good way to stay up to date with all of our latest educational publications. Uh, uh, sorry, of all, all of our latest uh, educational webinars. Um, next, you could also access the recordings from our website, so myloma.ca. You click on the resources uh, button at the top uh, on the top menu. Uh, the tab will open up, and then you simply click on educational videos. That will send you over to our YouTube channel, like you just saw pre on the previous slide. Uh, the other thing I kind of want to let you know is you could also access our educational publications from here. So if you uh, by this by doing the same thing, clicking on resources, and you can also click on educational publications, um, and that will give you uh, bring you to a list of all of our publications. One of which that I want to call particular attention to it's uh, it was published earlier this year. It's the uh, I'm guessing smoldering multiple myeloma info guide. And uh, here we have lots of different topics that are covered in the book uh, uh, for for those that uh, that do uh, that are diagnosed with uh, with uh, MGUS and smoldering myeloma, and they want to learn more about how uh, how it's related to uh, to myeloma. Uh, lastly, uh, to how do you ask questions? So uh, you type in your questions during the presentations. Please uh, don't 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 save your questions for the end. Please type them in as you go, so that so they're fresh in your mind. Um, I'm going to receive the questions. Uh, and at the end, I'll have a, uh, a discussion with our presenter in order to, uh, to answer those questions. So I'll ask the questions for you. Uh, so to ask a question, whether it's on your computer, this is the view from a, from a PC. On your tablet or your phone, it's the same thing. There's a little button that says questions. You click on the button or the tab. Uh, you type in your question. You click on send. And that's, that's how I'm going to get the questions. So, uh, so please send those in as we go along. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our presenter today, Dr. Omar Nadim, who is Clinical Director uh, of the Myeloma Cellular Therapies Program and uh, Instructor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School uh, at the Dana-Farber Dana Cancer, Cancer Institute. So uh, thank you, doc, uh, in Boston. So thank you, Dr. Nadim, for taking the time for, to do this. Uh, it's really, well, really appreciated, and we really want to learn more about MGUS and the smoldering myeloma. Excellent. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction and thanks so much for having me. Um, so hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Omar Nadim. I'm one of the members of the Myeloma faculty at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with you about uh, MGUS and smoldering myeloma. So I figured we'll start by just introducing the uh, frequently asked questions as they relate to plasma cell disorders. Uh, so first of all, what are plasma cell disorders? Uh, just to get everybody on the same page, this is an abnormal population of, of cells in the bone marrow, and these are plasma cells that are normally there to make our antibodies. And in, in these group of disorders, one of those cells becomes abnormal and starts growing in abnormal quantities. As I mentioned, the normal function of plasma cells is to make antibodies, so they're a really important part of the uh, immune system uh, based on their function. The other question that always gets asked is, what is an abnormal protein in my blood? Frequently, uh, patients have this uh, as the first thing that they're told when they're being investigated for these disorders. What this really is, is that this is the protein that is being produced by these plasma cells, which is essentially the antibody that that plasma cell was destined to make. Now, because it's growing in, in uncontrollable quantities, it's making this abnormal protein that spills out into the blood. And this could be many different types of uh, proteins. So this could be an IgG, which is the most common, followed by IgA, it can be light chains only, which is either kappa light chains or lambda light chains, and then in some rare circumstances could be an IgD protein and also an IgM protein. Uh, 
And then basically the question then is, what is the problem? You know, if you have this population of abnormal cells, what can go wrong? And basically in multiple myeloma, which is on the other end of the spectrum, the levels of these protein rise uh, quite a bit in the blood and the population grows quite a bit in the bone marrow. And this leads to several complications. So talking about the classification of various plasma cell disorders, uh, I figured we'll spend some time on this slide to get everybody on the same page. So you can see that it's a spectrum. So the first uh, condition is known as MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And this is diagnosed by having less than three grams of the M protein in the blood, less than 10% abnormal plasma cells in the marrow, and importantly, no what we call myeloma defining events. And myeloma defining events are essentially complications listed on the bottom of this slide that we call CRAB criteria. So this includes elevated levels of calcium, renal insufficiency or, or kidney failure, anemia, or bone lesions or bone disease. And, and this has historically been the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma because even if anybody has a presence of any of these abnormalities, irrespective of the amount of plasma cells they may have in the bone marrow or the amount of the protein they have in the blood, they're diagnosed as multiple myeloma because they've developed these complications and then they need urgent treatment. In 2014, the criteria for multiple myeloma was further tweaked to allow um, additional uh, measures that really predict uh, with almost certainty development of any of these complications within the next year or two. And this is listed on the right-hand side of this slide under the multiple myeloma section, where if you have more than 60% plasma cells in the bone marrow, if you have a light chain ratio that's more than 100 or more than one lesion on an MRI, then that is very high risk. And at that point, we call this nowadays multiple myeloma and treat patients based on that, even in the absence of CRAB criteria. Smoldering myeloma is somewhere in the middle. In this case, you have more than 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow, but less than 60%. You either have an M protein more than three grams in the blood. And again, there is no myeloma defining um, event that we just went over. So the two precursor plasma cell disorders are MGUS and, and smoldering myeloma. So MGUS is actually a very common condition. So it's estimated that 3% of the normal population will have a um, um, presence of this protein in the blood if, if searched for, so 3% over the age of 50. And this number rises to close to 7% actually over the age of 70. So it's so extremely common if, if searched for. It is also three times more common in African-Americans and three times more common in, in patients with family members that have plasma cell disorders. And when we think about the risk of developing multiple myeloma from both MGUS and smoldering myeloma, the bottom curve represents MGUS. So you can see that the risk is actually pretty low. So you can see that from years of diagnosis, it's about 1% per year. So at, at year five, you know, you'll have about a 5% chance and then, and, and then so on and so forth. So the overall risk for developing multiple myeloma from MGUS is pretty low, although presence at 1% per year, hence we follow uh, patients very closely for any of these myeloma defining events. Conversely, for smoldering myeloma, you can see that the risk is a lot higher and particularly the risk is high in the first five years. So in all comers, about 10% per year for the first five years, which predicts that about half the patients diagnosed with smoldering myeloma will develop multiple myeloma at five years. And then the risk does fall off a bit if you, if you haven't developed it at that point. And then it estimated to be about 2% per year. So more than MGUS, but, but certainly more in that category as opposed to the 10% per year that's present in the first um, five years. So based on that, we do follow patients uh, uh, obviously a lot closer uh, for patients that have smoldering myeloma to monitor for any signs of progression, particularly in the first few years. So when we think about other cancers, we know that we have identified several precursor conditions. So if you think about colon cancer, you know, you'd have a polyp, the polyp is monitored and taken out, and, but it has a very uh, predictable risk of progression over the next many years. And similarly, as you can see here, for some of the other cancers that are, that are uh, listed, you know, when we find some of these precancerous conditions, we are very quick to intervene to prevent some of the more invasive cancers. Uh, that can be a lot uh, bigger problem. So why is this important now in, in plasma cell disorders? Well, it really ties into the fact that we have a much better understanding now of these diseases and, and early detection is extremely important because, you know, if you think about, again, the analogy to other cancers, you know, when you identify the patients that are at highest risk, 
and you now have interventions that you can you can give to the patients that is safe and effective, you can you can potentially in the right patient population predict development of that cancer. And I think this is really the the point in in now looking at patients that are at the highest risk for developing multiple myeloma and perhaps offering them some early treatment to prevent some of those dreaded um, complications. And again, if you think about breast cancer, right? So you screen um, routinely with mammograms and detect early stage breast cancer, and obviously you treat as quickly as possible to prevent spread. But if you think about blood cancers as a whole, and specifically MGUS and, and smoldering myeloma and multiple myeloma, you know, we don't really do any routine screening. However, as I mentioned, it's quite common. So if you do pick up just with a blood test, presence of this abnormal protein, you can then really watch and carefully the patients that uh, are at risk for developing complications. And perhaps now with some growing data that I'll go over in a second, potentially intervene before obviously something happens. So, so it is something that you know, we are now looking into a lot more in terms of screening and, and uh, prevention. So now if we shift gears towards smoldering myeloma, again, that's the population that has more than 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow hence has about a 10% chance of developing the disease per year for the first five years, we are then now fine tuning some of those risk categories. So there have been several criteria for risk assessment that have been ported, starting with the original Mayo criteria from 2008, uh, where they looked at some cutoffs for uh, several factors. So this included bone marrow uh, plasma cells more than 10%. Having an M spike or M protein, which is the abnormal protein in the blood, more than three grams per deciliter, or having a serum free light chain ratio more than eight. And when they looked at these three factors, as you can see on the left, if you had all three, your risk of developing uh, multiple myeloma from smoldering myeloma was very high compared to just having one risk factor, which is the bottom curve. You can see that the risk is pretty low. So, so in, at five years, if you had all three of these factors, it's about a 75% chance of developing multiple myeloma. Conversely, if you only had one risk factor, only one in four people in five years will develop the disease. So this has been a useful tool in the clinic for us to identify patients that are at high risk. The Spanish group looked at uh, an abnormal plasma cell immunophenotype, plus looked at whether the other immunoglobulins in the blood were suppressed. And if they looked at these variables again, they were able to show a very similar graph where presence or absence of these features you know, would predict the risk of progression. So we've been using these criteria really over the past decade or so, trying to identify patients that are at highest risk for progression. In multiple myeloma, we know that the genetics of the cell are extremely important because they can be very much prognostic and, and can give us a clue in terms of how the disease may, be, may behave. It has been less clear in precursor plasma cell disorders if that still holds true. However, there is now data showing that if you have some of the same high-risk features that we see in multiple myeloma as listed here, namely presence of an extra copy of chromosome 1Q, deletion of 17P, several translocations including 414, and then other high-risk features as listed here, then that does predict the risk of progression that's a lot higher in somebody that, that doesn't. So we are now incorporating the same mutations that we check for in multiple myeloma in smoldering myeloma and, and classifying some of these patients at high risk based on some of this emerging data. Probably the most recent criteria that has been adopted has been uh, reported uh, in, in 2018. This is now called the 2220 criteria, which looks at now different cutoffs of serum M protein, serum free light chain ratio, and bone marrow plasma cells. So on the right, you can see the what, reason why it's called 2220 is if you have more than 20% plasma cells in the bone marrow, or if your light chain ratio is more than 20, or your serum M protein is more than two, then those are now independent high-risk features. So presence of two out of three of these would be classified as high risk based on this criteria, which predicts about a 50% chance of developing multiple myeloma in the next two years. So this is now a group that we are increasingly focused on when we think about some of our uh, early intervention efforts. Conversely, if you have none of these factors, you know, the risk is actually quite low for developing multiple myeloma. So this is something you know, that we're using quite routinely in the clinic. But again, we know this is basically looking at the you know, various cutoffs, which really just speak to how much disease is present. So obviously, if you have more disease present in the bone marrow or in the blood, then that puts you in highest risk. But it doesn't really give you a good sense of the disease biology like we just talked about. It doesn't really tell you anything about its genetics. Um, uh, which we know are increasingly important. So now we're looking at further fine-tuning 
that 2220 criteria to incorporate fish abnormalities, which are those genetic tests that I just alluded to. And then when you incorporate that, you can come up with this risk score that really predicts the patients that are at highest risk for progression. So again, these are the tools that we are using in the clinic to identify which patient is at risk for progression, again, which ties into how we may follow that person, and more importantly, who we may offer early intervention, which is a topic you know, that, is, that is quite controversial right now in, in management of smoldering myeloma. So we'll um, just shift gears a little bit to initial diagnostic workup. So when you are first found to have an abnormal protein in the blood consistent with one of these conditions, you know, we first look for any signs of this end organ damage, as I mentioned. So we check your blood counts, make sure there's no evidence of anemia. We check the comprehensive metabolic panel, which looks at your kidney function to make sure that, that the kidneys are normal. We check a serum protein electrophoresis. Again, that's how presumably the protein was picked up. And then also more importantly, serum free light chains. This is a test that we were not routinely doing and instead doing more urine studies uh, to detect the patients that had light chain only uh, disease, but now you're able to readily pick this up with serum free light chains. We check an LDH and a beta-2 microglobulin. These are markers of just disease um, burden and, and could be used in staging for multiple myeloma. And then urine studies, again, are used to detect the protein in the, in the urine and still used in, in some circumstances. We then perform a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate. Again, this is used not only for quantification of how many cells are present in the bone marrow, but also to look to see if there's presence of any of these high-risk um, cytogenetic abnormalities that we use, um, uh, that we define with, with fish testing, as we just mentioned. And then radiology assessments are extremely important. So historically, all we were doing were x-rays. So skeletal survey looked at your uh, bones from head to toe and would pick up these characteristic bone lesions that we see in multiple myeloma. Nowadays, we have, are using more and more advanced imaging. And this includes a whole body PET scan or PET CT, uh, or a whole body MRI. And using these techniques, you really pick up majority of these occult bone lesions that may be present uh, in the bones. Um, this is uh, something that, again, we, we are starting to do routinely, particularly in patients that have high-risk smoldering myeloma, because you want to make sure that there is no presence of these bone lesions that would upstage them to having multiple myeloma requiring therapy. Whereas the x-rays can miss up to 30% of lesions in the bones, Either of these two modalities will actually pick up the rest. So, so sometimes we start with x-rays if we don't have a high suspicion, but in patients that you do have a high suspicion that they may be at the border of developing myeloma, then these studies are routinely done to, to answer that question. So talking about early therapeutic intervention, there have been two phase three studies that have shown benefit of intervening early in patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma. The first study is a Spanish study that was published in 2013. And this looked at a drug called lenalidomide plus dexamethasone, which is a steroid medication, and treating patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma. And this was the first study to show benefit of early intervention, not only in terms of uh, uh, reducing the risk of developing myeloma, something that we call progression-free survival, but also it improved overall survival in this patient population. So it was definitely very eye-opening to see that, that early intervention with just these two medications made that big of a difference. The reason why this didn't necessarily um, become standard of care across the world is that this was around the time where the definition of multiple myeloma evolved. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we started to use uh, some different cutoffs. You know, if your light chains were more than 100 or your bone marrow uh, plasma cells were more than 60, or if there was you know, an MRI done showing uh, more than one bone lesion, those patients would be called multiple myeloma. And our suspicion is, since this was done in the previous era, that some of these patients may have actually had multiple myeloma, and we know the benefit of these therapies in multiple myeloma. So it wasn't exactly clear if this was a representative population. So a follow-up study was done, again, looking at, again, lenalidomide versus observation. And this was, again, in the same high-risk smoldering myeloma population, and it confirmed the benefit of giving lenalidomide early. So in patients that were on observation, you know, at three years, you know, there was 66 percent uh, that were free of progression, but it was 91 percent free of progression if they got lenalidomide, so clearly made a difference. This study also had a fairly heterogeneous population. If you dig through the details, which I didn't include in the slide deck, you will see that a fair bit of these patients would then be classified as intermediate risk. So this is where some of the controversies arise when it comes to management of high-risk smoldering myeloma, that you do have to really go through the details and see which are the patients that actually benefited from this early intervention, uh, because it isn't so uniform, it isn't so clear-cut. So this is why it's a very individualized uh, discussion 
with patients to see if they would fall into one of these categories and if they would truly benefit from this type of intervention. But I think it is important to note that, that times are changing very, very quickly in the field of plasma cell disorders, particularly multiple myeloma. So while lenalidomide was one of the first drugs that proved the fact that maybe early intervention works in this population, we also know it has some side effects. It has a higher risk of developing other cancers, which has been shown in some of these studies. Not very high, but, but high enough where it's worth a discussion. And again, we don't really know exactly who would benefit the most. And we don't also know if we're really kind of introducing you know, a different uh, resistance in these cells by exposing them to this type of therapy a bit earlier. So what we need to do is really develop, you know, a very specific precision uh, type interventions for individual patients' genomic and immune profile. And we think immunotherapy is really the answer here because patients with smoldering myeloma and even MGUS have much healthier immune systems than somebody who's had relapsed multiple myeloma. So we think that using the immune system there to prevent progression is probably the answer. And this is where a lot of the research is currently ongoing in this field. So in multiple myeloma, you can see here uh, that the list just keeps growing in terms of drug approval. So it started off with you know, using some high-dose steroids and an older chemotherapy drug called melphalan, and then came the introduction of a stem cell transplant in the 90s, and became, which became standard of care. And then since then, we've had so many drug approvals, um, including drugs like, that, like lenalidomide that we just talked about. But beyond that, you know, we have proteasome inhibitors, we have monoclonal antibodies, and now we're entering an era where we're using uh, BCMA-directed therapy, which is another target on the myeloma cells, and using CAR T-cell therapy, which was just approved for multiple myeloma earlier this year. So safe to say things are changing very, very rapidly. And when we think about smoldering myeloma, particularly high-risk smoldering myeloma, you know, we're really left to think about how we want to best address this patient population. Some of the challenges are that this is still an asymptomatic patient population, right? So you don't want to necessarily you know, ignore some of the toxicity that comes from some of the other myeloma therapies. But at the same time, you want to think about that individual patient's risk, particularly their genomic profile and also their um, you know, immune profile. So we can see which one of these interventions may be, they may be best served with. So we're studying lots of things. We're studying immunotherapy, including vaccines. We're studying T cell therapy, as I mentioned, with, with CAR T cells and bispecifics. Um, we're looking at specific mutations that these myeloma cells may harbor, including MAP kinase mutations. There's a translocation called 1114, which is there in about 15% of patients with smoldering myeloma. So there's a particular drug that is used for uh, targeting of that. And there's several other newer therapies you know, that are in development. We're then also looking at typical myeloma regimens and, and really administering them in the highest risk patients to see if you give it one step before developing myeloma, are you really changing the natural history of that disease? So we have several trials that we've done here and several ongoing, looking at some of the best myeloma regimens and giving them early in the high-risk smoldering myeloma population. And then we have some prevention studies in early smoldering myeloma or low-risk smoldering myeloma, even high-risk MGUS patients, again, looking at lifestyle-based modifications and other therapies that I'll get into in a second. But the ultimate goal here really is to cure this disease. And we feel that this is the stage where you probably have the highest likelihood of achieving that. Because you know, if you're able to intervene at this stage in a safe way, perhaps it's something that, that a patient will no longer have to worry about in their lifetime. So here are some of the ongoing questions that I've alluded to. So again, we need some new biomarkers to see which patients will respond and which patients will benefit from early intervention. We also need to answer how long do we treat patients for with this population? Because in multiple myeloma, in a lot of cases, we are continuing therapy somewhat indefinitely. Uh, and this is why a lot of prognosis in multiple myeloma has improved because patients will stay on maintenance therapy, for example, after they get their initial therapy, sometimes for you know, five, six years before they need anything else. And, and that anything else is changing so fast that frequently patients will cycle through a lot of these very effective regimens, which will you know, last many years for a lot of patients. So we need to answer that question in smoldering myeloma. Is that the way to do it? Or can we give them short duration therapy to spare them some of the long-term toxicity? And again, uh, maybe do more of a stop and go type approach in, in, in patients with um, early stage disease. And then again, we need to know what are the appropriate measures um, to test for so we know that this actually benefited uh, the patient. So ultimate bottom line is, is it going to cure the disease? If short of that, is, is it going to make people live longer, right, if you give an early intervention? And if it's going to delay progression to multiple myeloma, what's the disease going to look like after that, right? So and, and when will that occur? 
Is the disease going to be any different, right? And these are some of the questions that we're going to be answering now over the next many years um, uh, to see, you know, what the right thing to do for this patient population is. So now I just wanted to quickly go over some of the trials that we have done just to give you a flavor of what's going on in the field. In 2017, we started this trial looking at daratumumab, which is a very targeted myeloma monoclonal antibody that has been approved for multiple myeloma since 2015. It's very safe to give. Now it's given actually as an injection. It used to be given as an IV infusion. And this targets something on the myeloma cells called CD38. And this trial was done in patients that have high-risk MGUS or low-risk smoldering myeloma, so not the high-risk population that we were just talking about. And again, the, the, at the conception of the study, this is a time where this drug was first, um, you know, um, around the time it was just approved, we knew the safety profile was favorable. So we wanted to see if you give this immunotherapy, can you actually, you know, prevent the disease from, from growing? So this was the schema of this trial specifically, again, looking at daratubumab at, you know, several uh, typical dosing schedules weekly given for two months, and it's given every other week for four months, and then it's given uh, monthly. So this was done for 20 cycles, and then patients were followed afterwards. And this is not the only daratumumab trial in this population. Uh, well, I should say it's not the only daratumumab trial in the precursor population. It is the only daratumumab trial in this high-risk MGUS and low-risk population, but this has been studied in high-risk smoldering myeloma, showing pretty good results. So again, we targeted the high-risk MGUS patients, you know, again, that had, um, you know, less than 10, I'm sorry, more than 10% plasma cells in the, in the context of low-risk smoldering myeloma, or had any other uh, high-risk features as listed on the slide. And, and again, these patients could not have had high-risk smoldering myeloma based on our previous definitions. And of course, they could not have had any evidence of CRAB criteria, which is the um, uh, end organ complications, or any prior therapy for multiple myeloma. And this, this slide may be a little bit dated now because we do have updated data that we'll hopefully report at our upcoming meeting um, later this year. But, you know, we've treated 42 patients. You know, you can see most of the patients were low-risk smoldering myeloma patients. Uh, many patients still remain on treatment. And overall, the safety profile of this was quite favorable. And you can see that the patients, uh, you know, are starting to show signs of response. So over half the patients responded. Actually, close to 80% uh, or more actually responded, meaning they had reduction in the amount of protein in the blood. Some of those patients actually achieved uh, fairly deep responses where the, uh, you know, the, the protein either disappeared or was reduced by more than 90%. The next study I wanted to highlight that we did, uh, this is looking at now a three drug combination regimen for multiple myeloma that we use not uncommonly. And this combination is approved to be given in patients with relapsed myeloma. This is looking at an all oral regimen of another pill called Ixazomib and combining it with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, which are the two medications that I mentioned earlier shown to be beneficial in this population. And the intent of this was because this is the way we treat multiple myeloma, what if we added this drug to the high-risk smoldering myeloma population and see if this actually really changes the natural history of the disease. And here was a schema of this trial. So patients were you know, given nine cycles of, of exazomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and then they received exazomib and lenalidomide for up to two years in a maintenance fashion. And then patients were followed for up to three years after completion of therapy. And here was the inclusion exclusion criteria for this study. Again, this actually included high risk smoldering myeloma patients, again, that had more than 10% plasma cells and some of the previous high risk definitions that we just went over. And again, they could not have any evidence of multiple myeloma or any prior therapy for multiple myeloma. And this trial included 55 patients. Again, you can see here pretty uh, balanced in terms of males and females, the typical distribution that we see in terms of IgG, IgA, light chain disease. Many of these patients still remain on treatment. And, and we had some patients develop uh, myeloma, uh, particularly after they um, you know, came off of this two-year uh, therapy. So you know, again, we've presented this data at previous meetings, we'll update it. But as of earlier this year, you can see that some of the patients you know, really benefited in terms of achieving that complete response, which means disappearance of the myeloma protein from the blood. And, and a higher percentage of patients achieved this compared to the previous trial that I just went over. So we saw very impressive results with this, but it left us with this question as to, you know, this was a two-year treatment program because we're trying to limit the uh, long-term toxicity of some of these regimens, but you can clearly see some patients need the long-term therapy, and hopefully with these trials, we're able to figure out which patient population would benefit from most with continued therapy versus just short-term therapy.
the most recent trial that we have ongoing now that's enrolling patients is looking at what I consider to be the best upfront multiple myeloma therapy that currently exists. So this is looking at daratumumab, which is the drug that we talked about initially, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, just like the other trials, but adding bortezomib, which is a approved therapy for multiple myeloma that is given almost universally across the world to anybody who presents with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. So this is looking at this four drug combination because this combination has shown to be one of the most active combinations in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma and is quickly becoming uh, one of the standards of care to give to upfront patients with newly diagnosed disease. So we're studying this in patients now with high-risk smoldering myeloma, again, building upon the lessons learned from the previous trials. What we're hoping to achieve, because it's such a, a, a powerful regimen, we're hoping to achieve that patients achieve a very, very deep response. So not just disappearance of the protein in the blood, but really achieving what's called MRD negativity, which is looking at the disease at a very, very deep level. And we're hoping to achieve that because we know this is prognostic in multiple myeloma, and we want to achieve this uh, if we can in this population with the aim of hopefully curing this disease for these patients. And then we have secondary endpoints you can see listed here including survival and safety, um, et cetera. Here's a trial design. Again, this is another two-year treatment program. So this is, you know, we don't need to get into too many of the details here, but again, looking at, you know, these are injections, two are injections, two are pills. So it does require coming into the infusion center somewhat regularly, at least for the first six months. And then we start doing the MRD, uh, minimal residual disease um, assessments, you know, at six months, 12 months, and 24 months. And then the treatment does tail off a bit after the first six months uh, to allow for better tolerance in this population. And this is a phase two single arm study that's only currently being done at our center. So hopefully we'll share results of this coming up, you know, at, uh, within the next year or so. And again, we targeted the highest risk patient population for this study. So again, patients that have the traditional high risk criteria or high risk based on the 20 to 20 criteria. So this is not really designed compared to some of the other studies of the low risk patient or the patient that's very borderline, but really more for patients that truly have high risk disease that's on the cusp of developing multiple myeloma. So stay tuned for results from this study. And there's other studies ongoing that are similar to this, looking at four drug combinations, even looking at stem cell transplantation in high risk smoldering myeloma that's been reported, again, showing uh, you know, that if you intervene early with some of these measures in the right patient, you can really make a difference. So, you know, is that the way to go for everybody off clinical trial? I would argue no. That's why these trials are being done, because we can then learn to see which patients benefited uh, and, and what the right treatment approach for these patients would be going forward. And now shifting gears for another example of another trial that's ongoing. Now, this is looking at the low-risk smoldering myeloma and high-risk MGUS population. And this is looking at a, a diabetes medication called metformin. And I wanted to highlight this just to give you an idea as to a, a wide range of studies that we're thinking about in this particular uh, population. So why metformin? So this is used to treat type 2 diabetes. And it's, it's actually shown to reduce uh, proliferation of myeloma cells in the lab and also changes the composition of the bone marrow, uh, basically affects uh, bone remodeling and also uh, inhibits adipogenesis, which is uh, fat generation. So it has effects in the bone marrow and specific um, uh, effects in myeloma cells uh, in the lab. And actually in patients that are diabetics with MGUS, metformin use is actually shown to reduce the risk of myeloma in a couple of studies. So this is by no means definitive, but it's enough background rationale here we feel like a low-risk intervention like this in a low-risk population could be worth study. So here's a study design. So it's 80 total participants, uh, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either metformin or placebo. And this is the study is currently being um, run by Dr. Irene Gobriel and Catherine Maranak here at our center. So it'll be one-to-one -one randomization to metformin or placebo, and we're going to give this treatment for six months. Uh, you can see the schedule listed here, right? So metformin starting off at 500 milligrams goes all the way up to 1,500 milligrams once a day. Uh, and at those six months, we will then take a look to see if there's any benefit of this particular intervention by looking at the levels of the M protein in the blood and other measures. And the inclusion criteria for this is uh, being diagnosed within the last two years with one of these conditions, either high-risk MGUS or low-risk smoldering myeloma. And here are some of the cutoffs that we have for this particular trial. So with that, I wanted to give you a sense of, you know, to hopefully you've got a flavor of what kind of trials that we have ongoing in terms of intervention trials and why we're treating some of these patients with these precursor conditions. But a lot of this lives in this clinic that we have at Dana-Farber called the CPOP clinic. This stands for Center of Prevention of Progression of Blood Cancers. And this is a multidisciplinary clinic really uh, for patients with precursor hematologic uh, 
malignancy. So MGUS smoldering myeloma being one, but also looking at patients with precursor myeloid diseases and lymphoid diseases to see if, if you can really uh, have a home for some of these patients to do you know, uh, early intervention or other tissue banking type studies to learn about uh, how, to, how to advance this field and how to help the patients that have some of these precursor conditions. So here's the CPOP umbrella. All the way to the right, you just learned some, about some of our precursor clinical trials. But a big part of this is, again, looking at um, you know, the uh, various um, uh, patient samples to see if we can learn from a patient in terms of where they are in their disease process. So the PCROWD study, which is actually an international database of patients that were collecting samples from plasma cell disorders that are precursor plasma cell disorders. And again, this is universal in trying to identify which are the patients that actually develop the disease and which don't. You can see several other projects listed here, which I'll go over uh, individually in a second, but you can get a sense as to how we're trying to really address not only intervention trials, but also learning you know, with science to see which of the patients are the ones that are at the highest risk. And the benefit here, again, hopefully we'll be able to administer personalized care. You have a very dedicated clinic just for this particular group of diseases, so you get physician access. We tried to do this so that you can have some local lab assessments and then we can you know, maybe do a little bit more consultation in that sense uh, remotely, which has really been helpful throughout the pandemic over the past year. And then it really just gives you a good sense of you know, education and also trial opportunities that may exist, not just at our center, but even at other centers that have um, and trials for patients with precursor conditions. The PCROWD study, again, is looking at the uh, um, samples for patients that have precursor plasma cell disorders. And this has been you know, really the benchmark for our, our sample collection here. Uh, because anybody who has one of these precursor conditions enrolls in this CPOP study. And, and there's a big community that we've created because of this, uh, where we're learning together about how to prevent progression in some of these patients. So these are just some of the patient statistics. So in terms of, you know, kind of some of our current enrollments, you have almost 2,000 patients with myeloma, or I should say MGUS or smoldering myeloma present, but you can see some of the other diseases in the CPOP clinic that we're also studying, which are, you know, precursor myeloid and lymphoid conditions as well that are enrolled in, in PCROWD. The PROMISE study is, is, a, is a, a huge uh, national effort looking at screening for patients with high risk, um, uh, I should say screening for patients with plasma cell disorders. So this is something, as I said earlier, we're not routinely doing, uh, but we know there are certain populations at high risk. That includes family members, that includes African-Americans. So this study is designed to study anybody who's African-American over the age of 40 can basically have a sample drawn and sent over, and we screen them uh, for a presence of this abnormal protein in the blood or abnormal uh, light chains. We're also using some next generation assays such as mass spectrometry, which looks at the protein or looks for the protein at a much more sensitive level. So, so we'll see if that actually increases our ability to detect this protein in the blood for, for patients. The other population in this is patients that have a family member, first degree family member with any of the plasma cell disorders. And if you're over the age of 40, you're eligible for screening. So with this, we have you know, over 4,000 patients registered, over 3,500 consented. You know, we send them the blood kit and they you know, then collect the samples. And we've had some patients that have tested positive. So you know, right now, these numbers are very preliminary. So we'll report them at a formal meeting in terms of what the actual numbers look like as we enroll more patients. But just to give you a sense, you know, this is kind of where the study stands and it's been you know, one of the, the largest efforts to screen for this condition across the country. And finally, the impact study, obviously with COVID, you know, it's been really challenging for everybody over the past year and a half, but we're now learning that patients with impaired immune systems perhaps don't have the same level of immunity to vaccinations uh, and have you know, really uh, been hit hard with the actual infection, um, as you know. So this is now really looking at uh, you know, immune response study, to, you know, to looking at samples in patients that have precursor disorders and comparing them uh, you know, with, with some controls to see you know, what the immune uh, response looks like, not just to vaccinations, but you know, in terms of patients that have had you know, previous infections, so really learning about their immune system in the context of COVID. So with that, I think I just wanted to end on this slide. As you can see, there's a lot going on in this particular uh, uh, field of precursor plasma cell disorders. We want to basically learn with some of these tissue banking studies, genomic data, and then bring it back to patients looking to see which patient will benefit from which interventions. We want to look at potential for liquid biopsies, for genetic testing, looking at immune markers and studying immunotherapy, which I think is the next big wave in, in the myeloma therapeutic world, and seeing if something like that can be safely deployed in patients with these precursor conditions. So a lot more to come in this field, and obviously, uh, hopefully this gave you a little bit of a flavor 
as to what's going on. And, and at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Nadine, for that uh, that overview of uh, VEMGAS and small marine myeloma. Uh, lots to unpack there, but uh, thank you for, for, for giving it to us. So we'll start with the, the first question. Um, this is something that, that's always confused me a little bit, uh, so I'm going to ask you it. So we talked about the progression of MS being about 1% per year and, and, and how the risk of, uh, of from progressing from MS to, to, to multiple myeloma is about 1% per year. But we never really talk about what's the percentage of people that have MGAS that will progress to smoldering multiple myeloma. Do we have a sense, a sense for that? Uh, because it, it's kind of, I guess, when you, when you think of it as, as a continuum, you know, you need to pass through the smoldering multiple myeloma stage before you get to the multiple myeloma. So um, do we know how many MGAS patients will get smoldering multiple myeloma? Hello? Yeah, that's a great myeloma, right? Because it's sort of progressing from MGUS between phase, essentially, right? And that's really the, a lot of this will then depend if the trajectory is steep, then at that point, you know, smoldering may just be a stopgap diagnosis for them, and they're really headed towards developing end organ complications. So I think that population is uh, a little bit less defined, to your point, because when we've identified some of these patients, if we're seeing that kind of pattern, sometimes they're at risk for developing myeloma, and, and they may not have smoldering myeloma for pretty long. Okay, th th thank you. Uh, so, sorry for that. I, I I kind of cut off there. I think I lost a bit of a connection there, so I may have interrupted you. Uh, but uh, but thank you for for uh, I didn't hear your whole response, but th thank you for, uh, for 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 giving me that. Um, next, um, a lot of times, you know, uh, patients will will ask their doctor. My myeloma patients will ask their doctor. You know, are are my kids at risk of getting multiple myeloma? Um, and a lot of the times, the doctor will say, Hey, uh, you know, it's not genetic. Now, we, we, you know, um, can you maybe just expand a little bit about, uh, about you know, familial, uh, you know, uh, plasma, uh, the, the family of plasma cell disorders and, and how, uh, basically, uh, if it is actually genetic or if it's not genetic and uh, what's the, the nuance there, I guess? So we know that family members are at increased risk of developing you know, family members of plasma cell disorder patients are at increased risk of developing plasma cell disorders. The risk is considered to be two to three folds higher compared to the general population, but that overall risk is still actually pretty low. And we don't really have a genetic test, right? It's not like we can say because you have X or Y, you know, uh, problem or mutation, you, you're then, you know, going to pass that along, you know, to your kids so we can test for it, right? It's not like some of the other cancer uh, genes that we check for, right? So because of that reason, you know, we don't really have a good guidance, right, about kind of how to how to properly screen those patients. And that's where studies like PROMISE studies come into play because, you know, we're looking to see the absolute incidence of, of risk in some of these subpopulations, right? And if we identify that, then maybe we will actually have, you know, the tools to screen patients, right, especially the ones that are at highest risk. It's always interesting because, you know, I just spent all this time talking about how early intervention may be very useful for some of these patients. But then, you know, the big question is, how are you finding these patients if you're not screening for them? So on one end, you're saying early intervention is good, but then you're not really screening for them. So how does that make sense, right? So, so I think it really is tied in together that I think screening efforts in the population, you know, African-Americans and family members is extremely important. Does that mean that they just go get screened through your primary care doctor and just to make sure they have this protein or not? I think that's a little bit, um, probably a bit too much, right? Especially because, you know, some especially patients that are younger, right? So that's why our cutoff has been over the age of 40, because that's when the risk really, you know, increases of, of, of presence of these conditions, as I mentioned. Uh, but it, that may change, you know, that may change as we get better screening tools and much more guidance for some of these trials. So I think to summarize your, your um, uh, answer here, you know, the risk is higher it is not a genetic condition in the truest sense that you're not really passing it on and have a 50% chance of getting it if you have X or Y gene. You know, it's more just that you have to be aware of the fact that it can be higher incidence in family members and perhaps start thinking about some of the screening measures as they get older. Great, that makes sense, thank you. Um, so uh, you showed us 
you showed us a few of uh, a few trials, uh, a few of the earlier trials, and a few of the ongoing trials that, that, that you're doing. And and I think the first one you showed had uh, showed a, a progression-free survival benefit uh, at the three-year mark uh, for people with high risk smoldering multiple myeloma. Now, you know what happens? What happens after the three three-year mark? Um, do can these patients get this? You know, let's say they were. I think for that particular trial, they were on. Uh, on uh, lenalidomide. So uh, at that point, you know, if they develop multiple myeloma anytime after those three years, do, do they get Revlimid or, or lenalidomide or do they get a, you know, a full, full myeloma treatment? How, how, how are those people handled and what have you observed? Yeah, so so far we haven't proven that if you get you know, lenalidomide early, that that's gonna be harmful, right? In terms of changing the you know, what we call clonal selection, meaning are you like now picking out a clone that is gonna be more resistant, right? We haven't really seen that with some of the previous studies, although that question I think still is in a lot of our minds, right? That's why some of the trials are done with fixed duration because you don't necessarily want continuous exposure because then again, if they're progressing on some of these therapies, then you're right. I mean, the question then will be, what do you do, right? How, how do you treat that patient? Our practice pattern has really been to treat patients with smoldering myeloma as smoldering myeloma, and if they are not developing any myeloma-related complications, let's say they were treated on a clinical trial three years ago for smoldering myeloma and now starting to maybe show some rise in their markers, if they haven't developed myeloma, they still have smoldering myeloma. And at that point, you're treating them with you know, that kind of an intent, whether it's on another trial or with Revlimid or whatnot. But you know, it is an area that is a little bit um, um, unclear in terms of what the best therapy for that patient would be. I would say if you have a patient that has high-risk smoldering myeloma that you treated, on one of the high-risk trials, and then they're on one of those therapies and are showing signs of the disease getting worse, to me, that is a sign that they need proper myeloma therapy, especially if they're on therapy, right? Because they're starting to show some signs of resistance. And that usually would mean, you know, putting them on one of our first-line myeloma therapy regimens and thinking about things like stem cell transplantation and typical things that we do for patients with newly diagnosed disease. Awesome. And, 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 and I guess, uh, you know, let's say a patient has been on a trial for smoldering multiple myeloma um, and, uh, you know, at three years in, they have not, they have not, uh, you know, progressed to multiple myeloma. Um, so some of those patients, is it possible that they, they're kind of knocked back into the MGUS stage and, and now instead of having high-risk smoldering myeloma, they have MGUS? That's sort of the whole intent of a lot of these trials, because if you're trying to kind of reprogram the immune system, to put a lid on the disease and prevent it from growing. And if you do some of these immune manipulations and are able to achieve that, then that's really the point, right? Because then you can leave everyone alone and their immune system can then basically take care of it because it's monitored things, right? So that to me is the intent. You know, the, the number one intent is to cure it. The number two intent is to do exactly what you just described, which is, you know, kind of prevent the disease from, from growing again based on just some changes in the immune system. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, when we talk about the diagnosis of, of, of plasma cell disorders, we talk a lot about bone marrow biopsy um, and how bone marrow biopsy, uh, you know, uh, many as many patients know, it's it, it's a pretty painful experience. Uh, and so, you know, if if we're gonna pre if 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 the if the standard of care is gonna be to start pre-screening all of all of these MGUS uh, patients or, or or get there. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, about mass spectrometry uh, in the PROMISE study and how that, that's being used as, I guess that's a replacement for bone marrow biopsy. Can you maybe comment a little bit on, on that technology and how, how close it is uh, to perhaps, uh, you know, one day uh, taking over from bone marrow biopsy? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, certainly when we talk about bone marrow biopsies, you know, uh, as part of these studies or, or the need for them, it, you know, I think we should always be reminded that that's an individual patient that has to get a needle stuck in their hip, right? Which is which is obviously has a discomfort associated with it. So we're all trying to move on beyond that. So again, what is the point of the bone marrow biopsy? It's to one, diagnose the disease to see how much of it is present, right? Which then gives you the, the classification, whether it's MGUS, smoldering, or multiple myeloma. But now I think increasingly more importantly is the genetics of the myeloma cell, right? So we're looking for some of these fish studies and trying to predict you know, doing some of the molecular studies, right, to, to see which, which patients at risk for high-risk disease or not, right? So those are really the two big reasons to do the biopsy. Can you get that information with the blood, right? Right now, the quantification part 
no, right? We don't really have a good correlate because, because what I'm talking about with mass spec is really detecting the protein in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the amount of cells in the bone marrow. So mm -hmm. that is something that, you know, we, we won't have the good sense of, but then again, maybe you don't need it, right? If you have other prognostic tools to give you the same information, maybe you don't actually need that. You know, we're looking into other things like circulating tumor cells and detecting that and then seeing if you're able to do the same level of testing to predict and correlate that, you know, with the bone marrow uh, genetic results that's coming hopefully. Uh, and hopefully that'll be good enough to maybe prevent some of the biopsies for these patients. But, you know, we definitely need one at the initial diagnosis still because we want to be able to properly classify patients. And then after that, it really just depends on what we're trying to achieve, right? So if we're trying to achieve something like MRD negativity on a clinical trial, right now, the best way to do that is with a bone marrow sample. And that's very prognostic and a useful piece of information. If patients are having relapse disease, kind of what you described earlier, even if it's still smoldering myeloma, sometimes it's useful to get a bone marrow there to see if those genetics have changed. Right, so those are some of the specific examples as to why we do them and what we look for them, what we look for in them. But thankfully, for most of the monitoring, it can now be just done with the blood. Okay, great, thank you. Um, on uh, one of the earlier slides, you showed uh, about plasma cell uh, dis uh, dyscrasias. Um, you had a normal, and then you had plasma cell dyscrasia, then you had multiple myeloma, I believe. And it said something about smoking ces cessation. Is is smoking a risk factor for uh, plasma cell disorders? That was really done as a, a somewhat of a, an example of how we intervene in other cancers like lung cancer, right? So. You know, you, you identify risk factors and you're trying to mitigate the risk factors, right? So it's, we're trying to see the same thing in some of these precursor conditions. Now, you'll see reports of lots of things, potentially environmental, right, that are associated with developing plasma cell disorders and other cancers, you know. Nothing is entirely definitive, though, right? So what we're hoping for with some of these studies, particularly the ones in the lowest patient population in the screening studies, is to see, you know, are we starting to see any clues here? you know, about what, what may predict the risk of progression for some patients or, or, or at the risk of even having presence of these types of, um, you know, conditions. So nothing definitive there quite yet, but hopefully these studies will help answer some of those questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was, uh, we talked about MGUS, but there's this, uh, this term that's 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 being used, it's uh, MGCS, so monoclonal gammopathy of clinical significance. Now, is that kind of uh, a term that uh, you know uh, that is used when you don't have a diagnosis? Uh, well, what I mean by that is, you know, there's something happening, but but you're not sure if it's if it's if it's uh, myeloma or if it's something like amyloidosis or another uh, disease. Uh, can you maybe comment on on NGCS and, and what that is? Yeah, so we know that you know, obviously, we talked about multiple myeloma as the disease that. MGUS and smoldering myeloma can turn into. But there's other conditions that still arise from the same core problem, you know, which is an abnormal population of these cells in the bone marrow with making this monoclonal protein. But it can have a very differing pattern of complications. So one of those is amyloidosis, as you pointed out. That's where the protein deposits and changes its shape in various organs, leading to a very specific pattern of end organ injury, right? At the kidneys, the heart, and several other organs, right? So that's one that you know, is, is somewhat separate, uh, mm -hmm. but still can arise from MGUS or smoldering myeloma. The other groups of disorders, you know, we have a lot of patients with MGUS that have symptoms, right? And then you're looking for myeloma, you're looking for amyloidosis, and you're not seeing it, right? But there may be symptoms. But what kind of symptoms? Some patients have protein in the urine. Some people have neuropathy, not the same thing of the hands or feet, right? There's a lot of other associated conditions that we're then searching for. And that's where this term comes into play. Play. The one where it's probably the most um, challenging slash, um, uh, I guess, increasingly recognized is, is something called MGRS, which is monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. And what that is, is a very specific pattern of kidney injury that differs from both amyloidosis and multiple myeloma, but still is being driven by this process, right? And mm -hmm. it requires a kidney biopsy, for example, to identify that, right? So I have plenty of patients that come in, you know, their kidneys are, you know, becoming abnormal, and they have very faint amount of protein in the blood that does not meet criteria for myeloma, same thing in the bone marrow, 10% plasma cells or 5% plasma cells, but their kidneys are getting worse and they're wondering, there's no other explanation, right? Mm -hmm. If you do a kidney biopsy in some of those patients, you might find a pattern of injury 
that is actually related to that small bit of protein. And then in, those, in that case, we actually have to treat it, right? So these are increasingly recognized group of disorders, just to give you an example. So even though a lot of times they may not be related, right? Because by MGUS, by definition, shouldn't have any symptoms associated with it, but in some rare circumstances, it can. And that's why it's really important to search for some of these other conditions if there are unexplained symptoms. So if you're checked for these types of conditions because of some symptom, you always want to try to connect the dots if, if they are you know, related or not. Awesome, thank you. So uh, someone with MGUS, so we, we, you know, we said in general, you know, in, they shouldn't have any symptoms and there are people that still do have symptoms. Now, someone with MGUS, do they have a compromised immune system? Um, uh, is their immune system working uh, at 100%, let's say, uh, versus someone that does not have MGUS? Yeah, so you know there is a pop there is an abnormality within their immune system, hence they have this disease, right? So they have an abnormal population of cells that are plasma cells, again, that are part of your immune system. So by definition, there is some immunocompromised state there, right? Now, is it enough to be clinically significant, right? I think that's the big question, and I think for vast majority of people, the answer to that is no, right? In smoldering myeloma, we start to see some deficiencies in the immune system, actually, an increased risk of infections. Those are the patients that don't have or don't make the normal antibodies, right? And the kind of what I was alluding to earlier. You, know, you have some patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma that have immunopheresis where the other antibodies are low. That means their normal plasma cells are not functioning as well as they were, right? So that is a immunocompromised state far greater than you know, somebody with MGA. So I would say that, you know, yes, there's mild impairment of your immune system, but it should not be enough to lead to clinically significant infections or whatnot. Great, thank you. So uh, I have I have a question here. Maybe um, you know th this question maybe is a little bit more related to to, to, to myeloma. But um, I guess just so ju just to, to make sure that uh, that this person gets the answer to their question, um, you know, someone who has who who has a plasma cell disorder and uh, you know develops uh, a broken bone, uh, you know, because, uh, due to that, you know, they they would be considered to have small uh, i mean multiple myeloma and not something like high risk smoldering multiple myeloma is that correct not necessarily so we know mm -hmm. that patients with uh, these precursor plasma cell disorders or plasma disorders in general there's a higher incidence of you know osteopenia and osteoporosis so their bones are generally weaker so we screen for that actually in some patients with you know precursor conditions and and potentially treat them for those conditions with bone strengtheners, right? So it's possible that if it's induced by trauma and there's a fracture that occurs in the back or the arm and they have smoldering myeloma, you can't say definitively that that's because of myeloma. Now, if there's a bone lesion present there, different story, right? At that point, they clearly have myeloma. Some of it depends on the burden of disease, right? Also, if somebody has, you know, 40% plasma cells, they're very much at, you know, risk for developing myeloma, something like that happens spontaneously. That to me is very different than somebody who's, you know, riding a bike, falls, you know, breaks an arm and has 10% plasma cells and we kind of already knew about that and everything else is okay, right? So I think you have to think about it in the right context. So just know that the bone health is so important in, in patients with all these plasma cell disorders and you should always be screened, you know, for, for um, those types of abnormalities and perhaps get on the, the calcium vitamin D supplements, get on, you know, some of the bone strengtheners in the right context to, to keep your bone strong. So, for example, in a patient that would have like a, a, a fracture to the spine, uh, or then uh, and there's uh, evidence that there was a lesion that caused that that fracture, then that would uh, and they also have monoclonal gammopathy. That is pretty much myeloma. In that context, yeah, if they're having you know significant burden of disease in the bone marrow and in the blood and something like that happens spontaneously, then that's concerning enough. At that point, you definitely want to do a full investigation again to see if there's any presence of bone lesions, maybe repeat a PET scan or MRI, you know, potentially repeat a bone marrow to see if there's been any kind of a change, because that's really what you're trying to establish at that time. Okay, so I know we have one minute left, so I have two really quick questions. So the, fir the, the, the first one is, uh, in terms of side effects of plasma cell disorders or of myeloma, um, can, can plasma cell disorders have an effect on, on, uh, on, on your bowels, on incontinence or anything like that? Is there any relation there? Treatment of plasma cell disorder certainly does, you know, because drugs like phenylidomide certainly have that GI toxicity risk. On its own, it really shouldn't unless there's involvement of the GI tract, right? And in some cases, like amyloidosis, actually, that, that protein can be deposited in the gut, which is not an uncommon place where it likes to hide. 
So in that, in some patients that presents with GI symptoms, uh, diarrhea, sometimes constipation. So, you know, I, I would think more of that in that particular context, just having the presence of this protein in the blood or in the bone marrow shouldn't really increase the risk of any kind of GI side effects otherwise. Awesome, thanks. And so the last, last question, uh, fitting because you mentioned uh, amyloidosis in your answer, uh, uh, it's about amyloidosis. And for someone who's being treated for, for amyloidosis, uh, uh, you know, they receive a, a treatment, let's say with uh, Cyborg D um, and um, their proteins are undetect undetectable. Um, what happens at, the, at that point uh, when the if numbers start going back up? Do, do, do they receive the same treatment or are there different treatments available for these patients? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And, and you know, amyloidosis, again, we just had our first uh, regimen approved for amyloidosis really ever, you know, which was looking at Cyber D plus daratumumab. And, and that's a subcutaneous version of daratumumab. So, you know, that just kind of highlights what's going on in the field with, you know, it, it's always lags a little bit compared to myeloma because of just the fact that we don't have as many patients with amyloidosis than we do with myeloma. Um, so, you know, but, but the same therapies work in amyloidosis. You just have to have, you have to be mindful of very specific toxicities, particularly as it relates to the heart and fluid balance and things like that. But, uh, you know, your doctor there can certainly work with you to figure out, you know, which regimen would be the most appropriate at the time of the disease coming back. So there are definitely lots of therapies similar to myeloma, but some are more specific for amyloidosis that can be deployed you know, at the time the disease comes back. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadim. And with that, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna end the webinar. It's five o'clock and I know you have another meeting. So, so thanks a lot for taking the time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope to, to have you on in the future for, uh, for another webinar one day. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great evening. Okay. Take Bye. Care. Bye, -bye. Thank you.